Jurassic Park is the greatest thing to happen to dinosaurs since Velocicoaster. 30 years ago, dinosaurs ruled the Earth. And then three years later, I was born. And then I ruled the Earth. And then 17 years after that, I finally saw Jurassic Park. It was in theaters and in 3D. You remember in 2013 when all movies were in 3D for some reason? So much so that Hank Green created a business selling 2D glasses specifically to counteract it. That's how prevalent it was. Thank God we're past that. I don't even know where I would go to see a 3D movie anymore, and I couldn't be happier about that. What I'm getting at here is that it's been 10 years since I first saw Jurassic Park, which might be a surprise to some of you because I'm such a Jurassic Park girl now that you probably thought that I saw this movie in the womb. But no, we were a Star Wars family. And look where that got us! Not much further than the state of Jurassic World right now, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Today, I'm going to talk about Jurassic Park 1, as if most people haven't seen it already, because that's what it deserves. <laughs> Never had one lesson. Jurassic Park spends its first half really committing to being a science fiction movie. You don't even see any dinosaur action until insert time mark here. In the meantime, we get to slow roll in the characters. First we meet this blood-sucking lawyer of all people. Then we meet Ellie and Grant, who have a weird relationship dynamic going on. They don't even really fully commit to it until the sixth movie, which is a sentence that exists. They even spent the first act of the third movie being like, they won't, they won't. Stop asking, they won't. And then in the sixth movie, I guess they will again. Obviously, Jurassic World 3 is not for us diehard Jurassic Park 3 fans. Here we get Grant's personal aspects, which is he hates kids. And for good reason. I mean, look at this snot-nosed brat coming onto his archaeological dig, making fun of his hyperfixation. I'd hate this kid too. If I was Grant, the only thing that would make me change my mind is if some, like, kid who seriously emulated me to the point where he kind of looks like me got into some serious trouble, and I was uniquely positioned and qualified to save him from that trouble, but, like, what are the odds of- OH MY GOD! Then we get introduced to John Hammond in this baller-ass metaphor where the helicopter shows how much he disrespects science. He disrespects science so much that he teleports into the trailer from the helicopter. Or maybe he was waiting in the trailer this whole time and the helicopter's here to pick him up. I actually want to highlight this. Why don't I care that John Hammond teleports from the helicopter into the trailer? That's a mistake, right? And mistakes make movies bad, right? I am very smart, right? Well, this isn't really a mistake. It's not really an error. It's a deliberate decision to make the movie better. With this setup, we get the cool scene of the helicopter coming in and ruining the archaeological dig, and we still get the conversation that's about to happen in the trailer. The scene wouldn't be the same if John Hammond didn't show up in a helicopter, and if he had to have the conversation next to the helicopter. It wouldn't be the same. <laughs> We're allowed to give movies some artistic liberties, you know? Believe it or not, movies don't have to be one-for-one -one recreations of real life. Talking to you people who are complaining that the dinosaurs aren't bird-like enough in this, <laughs> it doesn't matter because the dinosaurs aren't even real. This movie takes its time. The first half is all about meeting the characters and knowing who they are and learning about Jurassic Park and what it is and what it's supposed to be. And most characters, when they're talking about it, are just taking big shits on it because it's a bad, dangerous place. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. You have plants in this building that are poisonous. You pick them because they look good. If it's hard to wrap your head around someone so rich that they did something that they could do but should not do by throwing away all safety precautions, imagine that Jurassic Park is some sort of submarine going to see the Titanic. Honestly, you hear about the idea of Jurassic Park and your first instinct is like, wow, that sounds really cool. And then every character that you trust in the movie is like, this is the worst thing you could have done. I don't believe it. You're meant to come down here and defend me against these characters and the only one I've got on my side is the blood-sucking lawyer. <laughs> Thank you. We're gonna sit at this dinner table and think about this. This movie reads more like a book. I wonder why that is. And I admire that this movie allows for time for thinking. We get a little action at the start of the movie to get the ball rolling, to make the events of the movie happen thanks to a lawsuit. But after that, it's quiet. 
It's slow, and it pulls you in, builds up, until the storm comes. And then there are dinosaurs in the movie, and who doesn't like that? The dinosaurs in this movie look great. The CGI brontosaurus, amazing to this day. This T-Rex, masterful art. This movie blends CGI and practical effects beautifully. In Jurassic World, when they had the one puppet of the Brontosaurus who's like, Whoa, the guy got me, I'm so sad. That one dying Brontosaurus in Jurassic World kind of took me out of it because it was the only real thing in a world of CGI dinosaurs. Compared to the characters of Jurassic Park interacting with this Triceratops, night and day. That's real. That's real and we can feel it. We can feel secondhand the joy that these characters are feeling on screen from being able to interact with a Triceratops. Cause that's wonderful. And not every movie can make me feel the joy of the characters on screen, but every time I see this, I feel it. This scene really makes you connected to these characters. I mean, like, obviously you don't want them to die to the tiny hands of a T-Rex, but these people are having the times of their lives, just like you would be. And it feels so good that they get to feel that. So good that you get to feel that too. Well, who does die in this movie? People who deserve it. Dennis Nedry, self-explanatory, the reason that we don't have Jurassic Park in real life. The blood-sucking lawyer who leaves two kids for dead. When you gotta go, you gotta go. Mace Windu for not promoting Anakin to the rank of master. What? Honestly, Arnold gets the short end of the stick here. He's just doing his job, but I guess he does believe that computers can control these animals, which aligns him with John Hammond, who doesn't die, but sticks around long enough to learn his lesson. After careful consideration, I've decided not to endorse your park. So have I. Art. Even Muldoon gets got, even though the entire time he's been saying how bad of an idea it is, but the love of the hunt just gets him and he thinks he can outsmart these clever girls. Disrespect the dinosaurs? you die. Compare this to Jurassic Park 2 where there's this guy who just loves dinosaurs so much and then in this waterfall scene he just gets chomped by the T-Rex because uh I don't know. I guess he loved them so much that he didn't like respect that they were giant carnivorous bird monsters but like all he does in the movie is point at dinosaurs and say that's a Pachycephalosaurus so that we the audience know that that's a Pachycephalosaurus. Then the T-Rex chomps him. I guess he was working for the bad guys. I mean, the scientists from Jurassic Park 1 are all working for John Hammond, technically, so... We don't have a babysitter here killed for spectacle. We have a computer programmer killed here because they kept the fuse box next to the raptor paddock. And in the end, T-Rex saves the day. Is it lame that they randomly have the T-Rex show up and save them by chomping down on the raptors? Absolutely not! You want to know why? I'll tell you why. It's this right here. When dinosaurs ruled the Earth. Fucking badass. No notes. Make more movies like this. I changed my mind. We have a beautifully balanced film on our hands. It balances humor and horror. It balances dinky Wayne stuff and dinosaurs go stomp. We had a film that was unafraid of showing us the dangers of technology without the proper discipline why you shouldn't dig up old relics in the past and keep shoving them down people's throats over and over again because it'll just end badly for everyone. Do you want this to happen? No! Let the IPs die! Uh, it also told us why it's so important to have a pilot's license if you're gonna use a computer. This film isn't just great, it's inspiring. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend that you do. And if you're still not going to, then at least maybe now you can fake your way through a conversation about it. I give it a raptor riding T-Rex out of 10. Soon I'd like to finish my Jurassic World trilogy review, but in order to do that, I have to watch Jurassic World Dominion again, and I'm just not strong enough yet. I'm training, and I will become strong enough for you. In the not too distant future, I'm planning on doing a Spider-Verse video. I'm just waiting for something to come in the mail. Thank you for coming with me and watching this video about a movie I really like. If you're here for my Tron video and you're wondering where all the roller coaster talk went, uh, I was basically just talking about Velocicoaster this whole time. I mean, remember when I mentioned the wave turn? That's a weird thing to talk about in a movie. All right, bye, see you in the next one. And then three years later, I was born.
That was scary. Oh, please don't. Did I show the backside of this shirt off to you guys at any point? The Raptors nearly got me.